Hey there, Java junkies. Whether you're out walking the dog, walking to work or class, or just cleaning your apartment, hope you're enjoying a delicious mug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it is time for another caffeinated career conversation. And oh boy, are you in for a treat today. That's because my guest, Dr. Arthur Brooks, has spent his life researching something that is one of the most important things in all of our lives. And if it isn't, it should be. In fact, books, songs, movies, plays have all been written about it. And that is the secret to living a truly happy life. Dr. Brooks is currently the president of the American Enterprise Institute, a nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C., and is the best-selling author of 11 books, including his latest New York Times bestseller, The Conservative Heart, How to Build a Fairer, Happier, and More Prosperous America. Dr. Brooks. Welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Always. I'm always caffeinated and ready to go. Great to be with you, Andrea. Excellent. Well, I am so looking forward to digging into this topic with Thanks. you. I know you've spent a huge amount of your time researching, reading other people's research, and studying to kind of Put your finger on the secret to living a happy life. And as you know, the Time for Coffee audience are 18 to 25-year-olds, so people who are just getting started and just trying to figure out their path. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to begin by breaking down this demographic into three main categories. The first are those young people who are still in school right now, currently in college, working on getting their BAs or their BSs. The second are those who've already graduated and are working in jobs they like, hopefully love. And the third are those who've graduated and may not have jobs or maybe in jobs that they don't really like very much. Could you speak to each of these groups, where they are in their lives today, and help them to internalize lessons to help them intentionally create and orchestrate a happy life beginning now? So... It's interesting to let's do a quick course on on what makes people happy. Uh, we have a tendency to think, particularly when we're young, that that happiness is all within the realm of our decisions. That if we just do the right things, if we make the right decisions, if we act the right way, and we get a little bit lucky, everything should be okay. The first thing to keep in mind is about half of our happiness is genetic. I mean, so it's it's and how do we know this? Because there are these studies on identical twins that were separated at birth and adopted to separate families, and they get them back together again when they're in their forties, and they do personality tests and they find out what part of their personalities are genetic and which are environmental. It's a pretty easy thing to do statistically, but what you find is about half of their baseline happiness actually is genetic. It comes from their common genetic code. So if you feel if you're a really unhappy person, it really is kind of your mother's fault, <laughs> um, or your father's, or both. Uh, it, gloomy. Parents have gloomy kids. And now, now, why is that important? It shouldn't make people upset. It's That's actually really, really empowering to find that there is a groove that you kind of get in. But here's the better news. About half of your happiness, most of that is actually in your hands. Some of it's circumstantial, but a lot of it has to do with the decisions that you make. And, and part of grabbing that is, is recognizing that you shouldn't try to, you shouldn't have a goal of being happy all the time or being happy every day. That's not the right thing to do. So let's take this first group, one of the first groups that you're talking about, people who are out of college and they're working and they don't really like their jobs. Super normal. What we find is that uh, the average kid graduating from, from college today, this is the age of my kids, um, are, are going to have on average nine distinct jobs and four totally different careers. Your first job on average will last about 18 months. Uh, and and in, so, so don't, if you don't like your job that much, don't worry about it. Just do it. Do a good job and learn as much as you possibly can. That's basically the bottom line. And in so doing, by the way, that's also the formula for being happy. <laughs> so, so not liking your job all that much, it's, it's okay. It's not forever. And you're going to learn a bunch of skills and the things you have to do to be better at that job are going to make you the happiest possible person. If by chance you really, really love your first job, well, more power to you. That's really great. Um, enjoy it as much as you possibly can. But again, be focused on learning as much as you possibly can and serving as much as you possibly can. And then when you're in college, basically think of it as your job. <laughs> I mean, people have a tendency to think of their study as getting ready for their work. No, no, no. Your work when you're in college is, is, is studying. I mean, no matter what you're doing, it's vocational. 
Think about it as intentionally vocational. And think of it as learning as much as you can, having as many experiences as you possibly can, and serving others as much as you possibly can. In other words, it's the same solution for everybody in all three of those baskets. So what about um, people who may be in a job that they like or love but are unhappy? Well, again, that gets a lot of that usually gets back to the fact that the happiness or unhappiness that they get is is outside of the realm of their work. So to begin with, again, you've got a fifty percent genetic component to your happiness, and you might actually have some circumstances. So you find with young people, a big part of the happiness on the circumstantial side comes with their romantic lives, and so they're getting tossed on a sort of jetsam on the sea of of relationships. It's much easier when when you're my age, and you know I've been married for going on thirty years at this point. I mean. There's just, it's, it's, there's variability, but it's not like when I was in my early 20s, for Pete's sake, when everything was a complete crisis. So a lot of that is affecting people's lives and their happiness. And the other thing to keep in mind is that family life and community life and, and, and metaphysical life, you know, even religious life, these things affect happiness an awful lot as well. Okay, so if you like your job or your job is just okay and you're really, really unhappy, the one thing, here's the advice that I've got, pay attention to faith, pay attention to your family, and pay attention to your friends. And if you pay attention to those three Fs, you have a much higher likelihood of enjoying your life um, than you currently do. So a lot of the interviews that we do at Time for Coffee are to help young people figure out which career path is the one for them. You've written that one of the biggest pieces in the happiness puzzle, not the, the fourth one, mm-hmm. not an F, is work their job. How how do you think a young person can figure out what job or career will make them happiest, will make them feel fulfilled? So there, there are two things to keep in mind. Um, the, f- what, what's fun for you is not necessarily fun for anybody else. Uh, I have, it, it's extraordinary to me. I have three kids and I have two sons who've already moved out, who've grown up and moved out. One is a rising junior at Princeton and he wants to come right out of his bachelor's degree and get his PhD in economics at Harvard and become a college professor. He's I mean, the oldest. Yeah. God love him. He wants to go into the family business. <laughs> My second son is a farmer in Idaho. And he, the idea of, of, you know, doing the stuff that I do for a living or that his brother is doing is just drudgery for him. Now, same genetic code brought up with the same parents. I talked to my wife and my wife uh, dropped out of high school when she was 16 years old to sing with a rock band. And she, she wound up graduating from high school when she was 29 years old. But the idea of getting her PhD and, or, you know, writing books or, you know, doing the stuff that I do just sounds horrible to her. She works with refugee and immigrant women. She talks to them about, you know, life skills. And, and, and so the, the, my bottom line is even within my family, my daughter, by the way, she wants to grow up and be an architect. And that, where did that come from? Everybody's different. Your, your concept of fun is different. So one of the things that I ask people uh, frequently in job interviews or, or young people who are just asking me for advice, I say, okay, if they're 22 or 23 years old, I say, okay, imagine yourself 10 years from now. What are you doing? Right? You're happy. What are you doing? And they describe to me what their what their best life looks like for them. And that's going to change over the course of your I mean, everybody's listening to us. You, you get to change. Your tastes get to change. But your basic concept of fun doesn't actually change that much. You know, you, what, what you're doing for a living and how you're organizing your family, that that's going to be kind of the way it is. So, you know, I found that when I was 23 years old, I thought about I just really wanted to be a professional French horn player. I literally wanted to be the greatest French horn player in the world. But when I was imagining that, it was doing a lot of the stuff that I think is really fun right now, which is giving talks to big groups of people, to doing things that, that are just empowering, to lift them up, to make their hearts sing. So it turns out that was a fungible concept of what my fun was, where my heart is. So that's number one thing. What seems fun to you? Now, if it's just, you know, smoking dope and playing video games, sorry, that's not a job. Well, who knows? Maybe in California or Colorado, that's a job. But that's certainly not a job in most of the country. So you have to think about something that's also productive. Second, so fun number one, and that depends on you, and that, and that is the most important question that people will ask, and they never do. <laughs> people never ask the question, what do I actually want? Because that's hard work. So get to work on the answer to the question, what do you want? Second is, how can I serve? This is really, really important in work when people don't feel that they're, they're earning their success in the service of others. They'll be 
frustrated. No matter how fun it is, it'll be unsatisfying. They won't feel like they're getting full flavor from their careers. And so what can I do that's actually going to lift people up? What's gonna, what am I going to do that's going to, to, to give their, other people's lives more satisfaction or to, or to, to help them in a very unique way? Because every day, even the days when it's not fun, when you go home from work and you feel like, you know, I actually helped somebody. Somebody's life is better because of this. Even though I had a terrible day, it's still really, really satisfying. So what do I want? What does fun mean to me, number one? And number two, am I serving and how can I serve more? So I have a friend whose son is very bright. He was a super overachiever in high school and in college. And he graduated about a year ago. Um, and he's not working in the field he studied. And when I spoke to his mom, who's a friend of mine from seventh grade, she said to me that he is afraid of making a mistake. So instead of making that mistake in the field that he studied, in the field that he's really interested in, he's working like in a regular job. I don't want to name the organization, but he's earning maybe slightly more than minimum wage. How can you help young people like him or like her out there who are just paralyzed by fear? Yeah, there's a lot of that in... I mean, part of being young is being afraid, actually. I mean, one of the things that one of the big mistakes that that older people make is thinking that young people have no fear, that they're they're really, really fearless. What they have is fear of of really giving their hearts away. And so one of the things that I often talk about with young people outside of the realm of work is they have a tendency to 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 be too fearful about uh, falling in love. For example, it's a really extraordinary thing. You find that people in their 50s today were significantly more likely when they were in their 20s to be in love than people who are in their 20s today in modern America. People, and, and part of that has to do with this risk aversion that people have, the, the risk against somebody having their hearts. And, and this is something that we see in survey after survey. So there is fear. It's not necessarily fear of failing in the workplace. It's fear of giving yourself over to something or someone. So one of the things that I work when I'm talking to young people that I work with is you got to take more risk. You got to take, you have to, you have to jump, man. You got to <laughs> do it. I mean, it's, it's okay to have your heart broken because that's how you learn. And now, now when we go to the, to the workforce, there's a kind of a parallel set of issues. People are afraid that they're going to fail in, but only through failure do you you actually succeed only through your weakness do you find strength these are truisms and you know you and i have failed over and over and over again we fail again and again we learn we we do other things we do the same things until we get good or we stop doing them because we get tired of failure but that's really part of life um the key thing is not to be risk averse the, the most interesting th- thing that i see for people in their 20s today, particularly people in their early 20s today, is that they're more risk averse than people from, from past generations. Do you want to be more successful? Do you want to be happier? Go against that trend of risk aversion in the current generation. Jump. Go for it. You dropped out of college, and please correct me if I'm wrong here. Was it after your freshman year, during your freshman year? Well, that's a good, that's a, that's a, well, you know, these are, we're splitting hairs at this point because uh, it's not entirely clear that I wasn't invited to leave college. So, so uh, the, the way that it worked out is I actually didn't finish my coursework in my first year. So it was kind of during, kind of after, it was on the calendar, it was afterward, but in terms of credits, it was during both. And then you went back to college when you were 28. Yeah. Is that a good formula for happiness and <laughs> for success? I mean, it seems to have worked out okay for you. Yeah, it did work out okay for me. How, now, how I would feel, the, the, the acid test for answering that question is how I would feel if it were my kid, right? If, I were, if my kid just is basically bailed out of college at 19 ignominiously and then came back at 28. I honestly think that I, I'm okay with all different sort of life paths because I think that you can earn your success in a million different ways in America. God bless this country for making it possible. Whereas in so many other places around the world, you have to go through a certain, you have to run a certain set of, of sort of legalistic institutional traps that you don't have to worry about in the United States. Um, but that said, you know, I've seen that not go so well for a lot of people, you know, dropping out of college and never quite making it back and, and being filled with regret and all that, everybody has to be very intentional about building their lives. 
So, I mean, when I left college, it was very clearly because I was going to go pro as a French horn player. It wasn't because I was going to go, you know, go live in my mom's basement in Seattle. It was I was going to do something with my life. I've always been very just very driven, very teleological, really super goal oriented, really, really ambitious. Too much so in a lot of cases. Actually, maybe I could have let life kind of come as it comes a little bit better. But, you know, when you see it, you know, a kid who drops out or gets kicked out of college at 19 and then kind of makes it back in, in his late 20s, you you got a certain picture in your head. Like I was some sort of free spirit. No, I was a hard driving, crazed, you know, classical musician. And I wound up failing to do what I wanted to do as a classical musician. And I went back to college because I needed skills to do something else. And, and I went and got my master's and PhD in quick succession because I wanted to become an academic and, and, and not fail the way I had failed as a French horn player. I mean, I didn't fail as a French horn player. I made a living at it, but I wasn't the one I wanted to be. And so this was all super intentional. And that's the one thing that I recommend is that people have an architecture for their lives, a plan for their lives, and they be very intentional about it and not waste time. Whether that means dropping out of college or staying in college is almost beside the point. What advice do you have for young people still in college? What will help bring them happiness while they're in school? And what will enhance the chances of them continuing to be happy or even happier after they leave school? So that's uh, that's a really fun, that's a really hard question these days because one of the things that we see is that levels of stress um, have gone up for college students, and that levels of depression are up, and and treatment for mental illness has gone really through the roof. Now, whether that means that people are more stressed out and more depressed than they were in the past, or whether it just means that there's better better mental health services on campuses, is not entirely clear. But I tend to think that it goes part and parcel with the fact that people are not. Uh, are more risk averse that they're that they're actually not undertaking the things in life that actually do bring the most happiness. So the key thing to remember is that there once again there's a happiness formula for somebody for a man who's fifty or 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 a woman who's twenty. I mean we're all just people and we're all just brothers and sisters and we're all kind of wired the same way. And that is your faith and your family and your friendships and your sense of purpose and service in your work. Those are really, really the sources of happiness, and those are the things that people should be paying attention to, whether they're a, you know, a junior in college or whether they're third year out, whether they're looking for a new job or anything else. Those are the, those are the key things to keep in mind. Uh, you know, and the, the first one, by the way, is really, really important, especially for a lot of college students. The idea that they tend to, a lot of people, young people tend to neglect the metaphysical aspects of their lives, and I strongly recommend against that. I strongly recommend that people develop their spiritual side uh, when they're doing a lot of the hard work uh, of trying to get through college at the same time. It's a big help, but it's also a big enhancement, the experience that people have when they're going through the, the kind of stressful drudgery of, of, of the modern college experience. So understandably, the primary focus is on finding a job in a career that is not only going to make them happy, but is also going to help them pay off school loans. Because mm-hmm. so many of these kids, maybe one of the reasons why depression and anxiety have increased is just the, oh my God, how am I going to pay all of these tens of thousands of dollars back? What advice do you have for them? So one of the things that I, I uh, pieces of advice that I often give for people who are just starting out college is that if you're going to have to go into debt for college, I don't recommend dropping out. I recommend going to a cheap college. And there's so many, there are 4,500 colleges and universities in the United States. It's extraordinary. So for people who have just no money saved up and very little capacity, I strongly recommend starting out in community college and then going to a big state school. Uh, Why? You know, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. It sounds like a really expensive place. So you go to Montgomery College for your first two years, it's $3,000 a year. And then in-state tuition at the University of Maryland, which is a fantastic, phenomenal university where you get your degrees, $9,000 a year after that. I mean, it's very little debt that it comes to. But instead, we have this mentality that I should get into the best private college that I can get into, load myself down down with that, and then go into a job market that's really, really precarious. That's just not good strategic planning. It's just not good business planning. And people in, in you know high school guidance counselors and parents and everybody else who give the, their advice to their kids, you know, I'm going to go to Bennington College or something. And you know, go one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in debt. That just starts with this huge. It's like you're rolling a rock up a hill coming out. So make smart decisions going in. Coming out, you'll have a lot less pressure to take a job that you don't necessarily want, and and pressure to make more money than you prob- probably can. Do you think that it affected your career at any time 
where you went to school? Um, not really very much. Uh, it was, I mean, occasionally, I have to say. I mean, the fact that I got my, I wound up getting my bachelor's degree largely through correspondence at a place in New Jersey called Thomas Edison State College, now Thomas Edison State University, which has all kinds of, you know, equivalency exams and online learning. And back when I was doing it, it was almost all correspondence, at least it was for me in the 90s. And, and you know, when I came out, I, I graduated when I was one month shy of my 30th birthday, and, and I decided I was going to go apply for graduate schools. And and most, most traditional conventional PhD programs didn't want me. You know, it's like Harvard is not, turns out, is not in the market for a 30 year old college dropout French horn player with a correspondence degree. That's just not the core demo that they're looking for. I got it. And so that, that does set you back, but everything sets you back. I mean, if you had a bad day in the interview, it sets you back. It, you just basically have to have a lot of deal flow in life. You know, and resilience. Of stuff. Totally. Absolutely. And so I went to a place called the Rand Graduate School in California, which is a public policy analysis place. I came out and that wasn't the best known graduate school. So I wound up not on the, you know, on the, in the market. I wound up teaching at Georgia State University, which is a fine university, but it's not its top tier school. And then I traded up to the best school in my field at Syracuse and I came here and it's a great country. You can do a lot. Sometimes you just have to take intermediate steps. You've shared some interesting data about middle-aged men, that the fact that men at age 60 are the loneliest. And while for many Java junkies, that seems like a million years off in the future. It goes by quicker than they think. <laughs> it does go by quicker. <laughs> Not 60 yet, but man, at this clip, it's going to come. So what, what advice can you give young men today to help kind of prevent that from becoming a reality. Yeah. So why are 60-year-old men lonely? And, and by the way, here's a, a statistic that I often cite, that 60% of 60-year-old men say their best friend is their wife. 30% of their wives give that answer, which is really depressing. <laughs> why? Um, and the answer is because women tend to get better at cultivating friendships as they grow older, and men get worse at cultivating friendships. It's a skill. Friendships are a skill. And most men in the workplace are highly domesticated. They're, 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 they're sociable. They're easy to get along with. They have, they're collegial. That's what men are trained to be is collegial in the workplace. But they don't make friends, particularly once they have a family. They get married a lot. Most men get married, and, and then most men who get married have kids. And for a lot of guys, uh, every minute that you're spending not with your family, you're robbing from your family because you're working super long hours. I've always worked 70, 80 hours a week my whole career. I've always worked really, really long hours. And, you know, when, when I was 35 or 40 and my kids were little, um, I, it, it would have been weird for me to go out with my buddies. You know, you go home as soon as you get. But the problem is when you're doing that, you're losing your ability to cultivate friendships and you get worse and worse and worse at friendships to the point where you're, you know, 50 years old and two 50 year old guys. Ordinarily, when two 50 year old guys are together, it's because their wives are friends. And so then and they're like the trailing husband sitting there. And it's like, I don't know. Do you like uh, baseball? Uh, you, uh, what about golf? And just making this awkward conversation is the worst. I mean, that's just and that's because they're bad at it is the bottom line. So, OK, so for. For young people listening to us today, especially guys, don't don't lose your friendships. Don't become bad at friends. You have to you have to keep friendships up. And I have a few really 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 close friends that ten years ago I didn't have. I mean, really close people that I talk to two three times a week on the phone. None of them live in Washington D.C. They're you know they're all over the country because I'm all over the country as well. But that's been a real blessing to me. It's an, it's been a, a reacquisition of skill. Is this something that you worked on after your research? Yeah, totally. I mean, everything I do is because of my research. Um, I'm a complete guinea pig for everything that I do. I mean, it's, fortunately, I'm not doing you know, research on, on hallucinogenics or something because, you know, this would be this interview would be going very differently at this point. Um, I, but I do, you know, when I when I find that it's bad to be lonely, lonely is a source of unhappiness. It's because of a loss of, of, of friends and an inability to make friends. I learned that about 10 years ago. And I said, this is going to change because I don't want to. I don't want to be lonely when I'm older. I hear you. I hear you. Well, thank you. Because I think if it wasn't for the courage of people like you who not only learn to improve their lives and enhance their lives and then share it out, so many others wouldn't benefit. So, 
My pleasure. You know, it's uh, there's nothing better. Like I said before, you got to have fun and you got to serve. And when you're doing work on happiness, there's nothing that's more fun. And that's the essence of service is helping other people to be happy. Absolutely. And I also love for those of our Java junkies who haven't seen Dr. Brooks, it was a, I think it was a kind of a TED talk. It may have been an AEI talk, but talking about how his wife is an incurable optimist and how interesting that dynamic has been in his own life. You really want to check that out. Um, Another thing that you did research on that I thought Java junkies would appreciate is those people who have lived their lives focused on loving things rather than people and how you can switch that around to actually make yourself a happier person. Yeah, for sure. So the, the, the general tendency, if you you know watch movies and television and listen to Madison Avenue and just marketing all around us, you'd, you'd think that the secret of happiness is to use people, love things, and worship yourself. I mean, that's basically what our, what our popular culture tells us to do, is to be really materialistic, to use other people in a kind of a utilitarian sort of way. Um, to use people to your own ambitions and your own ends and your own pleasures. And, and that, that they're really the object of, of your worship has got to be yourself. I mean, you're really, really self-centered and self-focused. That's what the culture tells you to do. That's how to live the happiest life. And that's exactly wrong. And there's a lot of research behind this. We find that people who do those three things have the almost near-perfect solution to finding the unhappiest life. Now, it might be by the time you're 25 or 30, you're most likely into the circumstances to pass on your genes. Maybe Mother Nature wants you to do those things, to acquire a whole lot of possessions so you look rich and to use other people uh, to your ends and to worship yourself so you're a complete egomaniac. Maybe that's the best, you know, strategy for having children or something. But Mother Nature doesn't care how happy you are. If you want to be happy, you should live a long time doing the right things. And, and, and it's to exactly switch around the nouns and verbs. So you should use things only because they're just things. You should love people only. And you should find something or someone that you should worship. You need to develop your own spiritual life. Worship, use, love, and make sure the object of those things is appropriate and you can live the happiest possible life. So you say to yourself, man, I really want that car. I really want that shirt. I really want that piece of status. You've just got your idols all mixed up. You've put things, uh, you've got your, your verbs and your nouns wrong. If you look at another person as an object in any way, whether it's in dating or whether it's in your career, you've just got your verbs and your nouns wrong. And if you are always the focus of your attention, if you are always serving yourself, then you've got the worship part wrong. And that's got to change. You, um, in one of your talks, have brought up the... 1978, I think it was, research uh, that looked at paraplegics and lottery winners. Yeah. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a famous old study. Uh, it got a, a lot of attention because it was so radical. It found it looked at, at, at people who had become paralyzed and people who won the lottery, and it asked how happy they were six months after the event. Now, everybody, most people actually will say that if they're in an accident, they're going to become paralyzed. Uh, quadriplegic, for example, loss of their arms and legs, they'd prefer to die. Most people say they would prefer to die. That's wrong. Uh, Give it a little bit of time and you wouldn't prefer to die. On the contrary, the people who've lost use of their limbs and were permanently paralyzed, after six months, their happiness is almost back to where it was before the accident. We're incredibly durable. We're so resilient. Um, Now, that doesn't mean they're glad. They, they still say, I wish I could walk. <laughs> I wish I could care for myself more easily. But their, their happiness has risen to where it was because we are who we are. Now, the flip side of that is that we also look at lottery winners. And we find that lottery winners, six months hence, are permanently slightly unhappier than they were the day before they won the lottery. There's a bunch of reasons for that. You know, when you do that, there's this old party game. Or you go around the room and you say, if you hit the lottery, what would you do? It's kind of an icebreaker when you don't know people because you can get a window into the soul. What would you do? And people are always like, I would travel more. You know, I'd get a job that I like more. I'd support myself as a writer or, you know, I'd go get my master's degree, you know, something. They never say, you know, if I hit the lottery, you know what I'd do? I think I'd buy a bunch of crap I don't really want or need. And then I think uh, I think I would uh, probably have all of my family members try to take advantage of me. And then I would marry somebody who only loves me for my money. 
It, no, but that turns out to be what actually happens <laughs> to people who win the lottery over and over and over again. And that's the reason they make the wrong life decisions. The key thing to keep in mind from the, that lottery study is that when you don't earn it, you don't want it. You need to earn what you have, earn success. That's the work part of the, the, the happiness equation. It's actually not the work per se. It's the earning of your success. It's the achievement that actually comes in serving others through your own merit and hard work and personal responsibility. If you have something and you got it for nothing, it'll, it'll never bring you satisfaction. On the contrary, and if you have a lot of it, you'll always wonder. It's one of the things I've, I've, I've worked a lot with people who've inherited a lot of money. And it, it's funny. Sometimes they'll do really great things. But the first thing that they'll talk about about themselves is, yeah, I, I, I inherited a lot. I mean, I have this friend who, he has this funny story. He says, I asked him, his, he's very, very rich, and I said, I asked him for the secret to his success. And he says, well, he's really a funny, self-deprecating guy. He says, yeah, it started when I was 12. You know, I was out of the edge of town, and, and, and there was a, there was a in Kansas, and there was a, an apple orchard, and I was, I was looking up in the tree, and it was so beautiful and full of apples. Now, a farmer walks up to me and says, hey, kid, you want an apple? And I said, yeah. He said, I'll give it to you for a, for a nickel. I said, okay, I'll give him a nickel. And he gave me an apple, and I was walking into town. I was about to eat it, and a businessman comes up to me and says, that's a great-looking apple, kid. I'll give you a dime for it. And I thought, that's 100% profit margin. Amazing. So I took my dime out to the edge of town. I got two apples, and I brought And I realized that I could double my money every single day. So I did this. You know, my bike, boxes of apples, and then a couple of years go by, and I'm borrowing my uncle's truck and truckloads of apples, and this is the secret of my success. I did this doubling my money, week after week, month after month, year after year, and then my father died and left me $100 million. <laughs> it, that's not the ending you expect from a story no. like that. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and his, his point was, is basically, did I earn it? Yeah, you decide. <laughs> That's not satisfying. That's not a rags to riches story. The reason that we love the rags to riches story, or, or in the case of the American dream, the, the bottom to the middle stories are the ones that are really, really, really satisfying is because they're the stories of the earned success that really gives us our heart's desire. And so that's the key thing that we have to really pay, pay a lot of attention to. If you're doing something and you're getting something for nothing, whether it's lottery or inheritance or welfare or anything, if you're on the dole from your parents, it's a problem, and you need to walk away if you can. So something you walked away from when you were 19 was school, hmm. and you went, as you said, and became a professional musician, French horn player, traveled around the U.S., traveled around Europe. Um, amazing. And then you went back to school. Hmm. Um, I was going to ask you about your extracurriculars, but you obviously had a big extracurricular, which was playing the French horn. Was there anything else in your life that you did that you look back on and you say, oh, yeah, that really was something I think other people should try to do? Mm. You know, it's I've never had any hobbies my whole life. No hobbies. You don't call French horn a hobby? It was never a hobby. It was my job from the time I was nine years old until the time I left it as a professional at 31. So I was nine until I was 19. I studied intensively. I did nothing else. I marginalized everything else in my life. I practiced hours and hours a day, played in every ensemble, did every competition I possibly could. At 19, I went full time, and that's all I did. I was just all in. On the side, for the last three years as a French horn player, I was studying to get my bachelor's degree and master's degree because I had to do that. But that was hardly a... And I'm glad I did it. It was very rewarding and valuable and sometimes even fun. But it wasn't it, it wasn't a sidelight. Along the way, I mean, I played for a bunch of seasons in the Barcelona Symphony in Spain. And, and so, you know, learning, live, living in a different culture, um, um, learning different languages, that was really very valuable to me. But it, they weren't hobbies. They were entirely utilitarian. I actually recommend to young people that they not do it the way I did it. Um, I think I've actually missed a lot of the life in life by never having one single hobby. People say, I mean, I'm, I go to the gym for an hour a day, but that's because I got to keep the machine tuned up. You know, working 80 hours a week, you got to be sharp. You have to be able to go on jet lag and not very much sleep. It's really, really important at a high level of performance that, that the machine be working right. I don't drink alcohol. I keep a vegetarian diet. You know, that's these are the kinds of things that I do. But again, it's because I'm insane. You know, this is not necessarily something that I would recommend. I, I, I have friends who they have, they have, you know, pretty balanced lives. My, you know, my best buddy, he lives in Atlanta. He golfs like three times a week. And I'm like, What? How long does it take you? He says, I don't know, like three, four hours. Like, three, four hours? You can be working, man. And he says, no, but I, I don't want to be working. It's a 
it's different. So it's a very interesting question that you ask me, and I'll say no side lights ever, no hobbies ever, and I'm doing it wrong. And I'm a happiness expert, so you can trust me. That's another conversation, I think. Um, so one of the things that we try to do in Time for Coffee is to help our Java Junkie community realize that even people who have reached the pinnacle of their careers have had low times, have had challenges, have had bosses that they hated or supervisors that were masochistic or whatever, and had to dig deep to kind of come out the other side. Could you share a story with us about a time in your professional life when that may have been the case for you and how you were able to dig deep and come out the other side? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> So I've, I've had three completely different careers, and I'm about to embark on my fourth. I'm, I'm retiring as president of AEI in a year, but I'm 54 years old, so I've got you know 20 years left in my work life probably. And, and so I'm about to start a new career. I have no idea what it's going to be. I'm going to be I'm figuring that out. And what I know is the first 18 months of a new career is brutal because you're incompetent. But it, but you have to be incompetent because there's no other way. There's no other way. You have to you have to learn. You have to skill up, and skilling up means you're starting from not up. You're starting from down, and you have to let that happen. And it's really really super hard. The number one reason that people fail when they do something new is they don't allow themselves to suck. And you have to suck, and you have to beg people for their indulgence, and you have to hope that people will be really, really nice to you. Okay, so this leads me to the answer to your question. Number, <laughs> number one, uh, the, the worst time that I can, that's really pretty recent, is 10 years ago when I came as president of AEI. I was a college professor. I was just a guy in professorial, professorial obscurity, beavering away, writing really esoteric academic journal articles like genetic algorithms and public economics, stuff like that. You know, and it's super fun, it was good. And, and I wind up getting drafted for this job, this very public job. It's got a lot of TV and it's got a lot of speeches. And this is really super new to me. By the way, hundreds of employees. I'd never had even one employee in my life. And, and we were in debt. I mean, we were running a deficit, which means I had to cut costs 16% my first 60 days on the job. All of this together, it was, it was hell. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt incompetent, and I felt I just it was so screwed up. And you know, my board—there are these hard-charging guys on this board. They're they're all private equity managers and hedge fund people, and they're very wealthy and they're super successful. And my first board meeting, the first topic on the board agenda was the terms of my severance. <laughs> <laughs> just in case, because they knew it was at least 50-50 that I was going to flush, that it just wasn't going to work out. And I remember, you know, coming home to my wife, Esther, and saying, honey, um, this is the worst. This is the worst time I've ever had professionally, and I hope I ever do. Probably it isn't the worst time I've ever had professionally. Probably that's still to come. <laughs> How did you come out the other side? Learning. Learning, working, learning, working, and then rem and praying a lot too. I mean, it was I, I knew it was going to get more fun because I have enough experience talking about. I mean, I, I, I do work, you know, workforce happiness stuff. But furthermore, this was my third career. I mean, I've done new careers before, and I know that it gets easier and more fun. And and then also just praying to be a better servant. Just make me a better servant. I mean, the whole point of my job as president of AEI is not just you know, it sure is dandy and fun to run a think tank. I've got seventy five geniuses working for me as faculty, not working for me, working for the organization as faculty, and then and then working alongside them, a couple of hundred staff people that are supporting them in communications and fundraising and accounting and business functions. And it's beautiful and it's good. And, and they're making the world a better place. And so focusing on the fact that that I am a I am a servant. I'm put here to serve people at the margins of society. I am put here to to serve people that need America to be a good and just and strong country here and around the world. It's very important that we remember that. And, I'm, and you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm put in the stewardship position for a reason and saying, Lord, tell me the reason, because I can't quite see it right now. But, but, and, but I'm going to get it, and I'm lucky to be here, and, and, and please help me to be a better servant. And That's how, how long did it take? 18 months. It always takes 18 months. 
it's one of the things that I recommend. You know, I'll talk to guys my own age, and uh, and they're always you know who are going into something new. They're changing jobs, and there's a very interesting piece of literature out there, uh, body of literature out there that talks about how how terrible it is to change. And, and, and what you find is if you change location, so moving, and you change jobs, and if you change career, that is as dislocating emotionally for you as a spouse dying. Now, the key problem is that you're basically in a state of profound grief when this is going on, but everybody's saying, congratulations, that's fantastic, that's so great, your career's, and you're like, but I feel bereft. I feel like I'm going to cry. So why is that? And, and so this, this, this kind of cognitive dissonance just racks your soul. And so I'll tell people who are doing this all the time, because I've seen the literature on this, I've experienced it myself, is never, 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 never judge the quality of your decision within the first 18 months because you're, not, you're, you're psychotic. You're not, you're not in a good state of mind. It's the kind of thing where it's like when you get off an 18-hour flight and you're 12 hours off in jet lag, don't make a decision on buying a house or a marriage proposal. Because your your biorhythms are all goofed up. Well, it's the same thing. I mean, you can't judge whether or not you made the right decision by changing jobs or careers. You know, there were a lot of times in my first year and a half running AEI. I mean, it's the best job in Washington. And yet, all I wanted to do was to run back and be a professor at Syracuse. That is that is not right. That would have been bad decision making. And a lot of times, once again, I had to look back on my own research. I had to look at things that I personally had written. It's like, I've given this advice a hundred times, and I'm going to take it myself. Don't judge for the first 18 months. And it worked. It worked. It did work. Thank God. It worked. But by the way, there are lots of times that things are mistakes. And after 18 months or two years or two and a half years, it's like, yeah, I think I would have been better served and I would serve my family and I would be a better servant uh, doing something else. Then that's okay, too. (laughs) I'm smiling because the jury's still out. You know, time for coffee. This is all new. Totally. I'm, I'm in that 18-month uh, oh, completely. stretch here. Yeah, completely. I mean, you're, you have a lot of background and, you know, work where you're expressing <laughs> ideas to other people. You're trying to make me feel They're better. Fungible. These are fungible skills, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> and everything good is fungible. I mean, it's interesting. You find that you, you, you take one thing from your college life into your first job and many things from your first job into your second job. Ideas, creativity, service, having a good person personality, bringing people together, uh, ebullience, all that stuff is really, really fungible. And, you know, that, that's what people are hiring on, and that's what's going to make you successful. You'll be fine, Andrea. Trust oh, me. Oh, my goodness. So my final question, Dr. Brooks, yeah. is if you could go back, not necessarily to Thomas Edison, but to go back and have a college experience again, and you had an unconventional one, what advice would you give your younger self based on the wisdom that you have today as a 54-year-old? Yeah, so, so I am giving that wisdom because I've got two college-age kids, and I've got one more who's about to become a college-age kid. So, so I'm giving that advice all the time. And one is a college student, the other is not. And I gave them the same advice, is to actually figure out uh, what, what an enjoyment of your life actually looks like in your mind's eye going forward. And, you know, I don't think I did that. You know, I had a concept when I was 18, 18, 19 years old of being famous, of being great, of having the adulation. I get, again, this is really a lot of people listening to like, what, as a French horn player? What a weird guy. I mean, I, I, I get that if you're not in the world of classical music, but everybody's, you know, into something. And, and it is a real world out there of classical music. And so I, I think I kind of had, had the wrong goal of what the successful me meant. And that held me back. If when I was 18 years old, I had a much stronger sense of <clears throat> being successful means enjoying your life and serving others, which is exactly what I'm telling my sons who are now out of the house and what I'm telling my daughter who's going into her sophomore year in high school. I think there's, I would have had a much better sense of, of the, the why of my life. Dr. Arthur Brooks, thank you truly from the bottom of my coffee cup (laughs) for making time to have coffee with me and the Java Junkie community today. I just, I can't imagine a more important interview for them to hear. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to seeing incredible success of this important podcast.